Hi, Bill Nadera here, and welcome to my channel, where we dive deep into endodontic domain knowledge so I can help you perform better clinical endodontics to establish better outcomes and a better experience for your patients. If this is your first time here, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and click that bell so you get instant notifications when I post a new video. The case we're going to be discussing today, tooth number two, came to me on emergency. We diagnosed it as symptomatic irreversible pulpitis and symptomatic apical periodontitis. First thing we're going to do, let's look at the PA. PA shows tooth number two here with a large restoration and dropping really deep on the mesial, uh, possibly close to the gingiva, possibly close to the alveolar crest. We can see also in this image that there's other teeth that are restored with full coverage restorations and prior root canal treatments. And although I do also see those issues on some of those prior root canal treatments, this patient was here to see me for treatment of tooth number two, so that's going to be our focus here for today. Although we do get a lot of information from our periapical images, I always like to take that cone beam scan because that gives me a lot more information than just our PAs. So after we open up the cone beam, we can see that all three views are visible, axial, coronal, sagittal. I've already got this scan lined up to where I can actually begin to read this for endodontic purposes. So I'm going to look at the sagittal plane first. We can see here in this sagittal view that tooth number two on the palatal root has an area of low density right in this area with maybe a little expansion there around the sinus, the maxillary sinus area. It's not uncommon to see areas of low density around roots, even in vital cases. As we manipulate this scan and we pull it towards the buckle, we can get a better idea of what's going on in these buckle roots. We can also see in this view the large restoration here and the exposure of the pulp chamber proper. We see the inflammation here of the Schneiderian membrane as a reaction to what's going on there in the pulp. Switching to the coronal view, we see this right here in the center. This is a pulp stone. That may play a factor during access, so we've got to recognize the fact that it's there. The coronal aspect shows that area of low density here so what we want to do is now maximize the axial and see if we can't get a little more information about what's going on axially here. So we'll maximize the axial scan. And what I like to do when we review the axial scan is I like to start at the coronal aspect and then work my way apically. So let's line that up in the coronal. It's lined up right where we want here. We're going from posterior to anterior, so here's our tooth number two right here. As I advance here, what I'm looking for is the areas of low density with inside the tooth itself, because that helps me understand internal tooth anatomy. And we're reading the scan not as an oral maxillofacial radiologist would, but we're reading it as an endodontist would. We're looking only at root canal anatomy and root morphology at this point in time. So let's take a closer look here. We're going to zoom in on tooth number two, and what we're seeing here is the actual pulp chamber itself, right in this area. And this area of high density right in the center, well, that's that pulp stone that we saw before. We're gonna continue advancing apically, and we're gonna watch these roots divide. Again, a better view of the pulp stone sitting right here in the center. This, this can affect your access, so it's important to see that. This isn't visible on the periapical imaging, at least not in the view that we captured. So as I advance here, we begin to see where these canals begin to divide. We have the mesial buckle in this area, distal buckle here in this area, and the palatal here. Continue advancing apically. We can see the morphology of this root change quite a bit. 
here's about the mid root level. And what we see is a separate distal buccal root. And we see a combined mesial buccal palatal root complex, almost as a fused situation here. These are really tricky to deal with because we know, based on our histological studies, that there's going to be some tissue that's in between the mesiobuccal canal proper and the palatal canal proper. And the question is, is how do we address the tissue in this space? Is it possible to even address the tissue in that space? Advancing apically, we can see that the morphology of this tooth, even the apical third, remains fused. We still see one main canal here, here in the palatal. We see one main canal here in the mesial buccal. The odds and likelihood of something in here, in this area, in the region, extremely high. As we reach the apical area, we can see that the fused morphology extends all the way into the apical third and the area of low density that's wrapping around the palatal root, which is consistent with what we saw in both the sagittal and the coronal aspects of the scan. So we apply proper anesthesia, we test that anesthesia, and then we get our aseptic isolation. For this particular treatment, I chose to use a single tooth isolation technique with rubber dam blockout material to really create that nice aseptic feel. Clinically, looking at this tooth here, we see that restorative material that showed up on the PA as more, as, more or less an, an IRM, some sort of intermediate restorative material. And the challenge is how deep does this go and how is it related to the, the biologic width and the attachment. So after the entire temporary restoration is removed and the residual caries is removed, this is what we're left with. So we can see a couple of things here. Number one, we're confirming the fact that we're dealing with a vital pulp. We see the hemorrhaging with inside the root canal system confirming the vitality of this tooth, which is also consistent with the diagnosis of irreversible pulpitis. We also see right there in the center the more opalescent appearance on the pulpal floor. That's the pulp stone that we saw on the cone beam. Now pulp stones can flick out sometimes very easily with a spoon or an explorer. Sometimes they're just floating in the pulp itself, but sometimes they're pretty tightly bound down to the actual floor of the tooth or the side of the tooth. And it takes a little more effort sometimes to get those things off. If they don't flick off right away for me with a spoon or, or an endo explorer, sometimes we have to take either some ultrasonics and loosen them that way, or in fact, sometimes a burr will also do the same job. I chose to remove this pulp stone with the burr that I was accessing with because it was convenient for me, which was a 557 surgical length burr. We can see after that pulp stone is removed, we have a nice uh, clean chamber here and we have that vital pulp. The challenge now is how are we going to contain our irrigation solutions due to the severity of the defect here that's off towards the mesial. One of the most important aspects of endodontics is to reduce that internal bioload. We not only do that with our instruments, we do that with our solutions. But if our solutions can't be contained with inside that root canal system or actually the pulp chamber proper, then they're not going to really do exactly what we want them to do as predictably as we want them to do them. So the first order of business for me is to work on establishing an environment inside that tooth that will contain my solutions inside this tooth. So in order to do that, we do pre-endodontic buildups with bonded resins. It becomes important when we're doing these pre-endodontic buildups to protect the canals and protect the, the pulp chamber proper. Uh, when we're doing bonded resins and pre-endodontic buildups, it's really easy for some of this material to go inside the actual pulp chamber, sometimes inside your canals, and block you out. And if you're blocked out, it becomes a little bit more challenging than to relocate those canals. So one technique that I tend to use for pre-endodontic buildups is I block out that pulp chamber proper with some warm thermoplasticized gutta percha. We can see that we can inject this warm thermoplastic gutta percha inside the pulp chamber, and it actually just adds an additional barrier. So if any bonding agent or any flowable resin that I place to build this tooth back up, uh, gets into that area, I don't have to worry about it going down into my canals or blocking me out. Once I have enough material in place, then we want to follow all the steps that we normally would for any sort of restorative dental work. Etch, prime, bond. 
I tend to use a flowable composite resin because that's what I feel comfortable doing. Uh, I always bond it in place under aseptic protocol in a dry environment. So I will give my restorative dentist the option to either leave my bonded resin in place and build off of it, or they can choose to replace it altogether if they prefer to use a different sort of material. I tend to freehand my buildups because that's what I'm comfortable doing. Certainly the other option is to consider placing a matrix of some kind in there. You can see that just based on the addition of that material, we now have an environment that will contain those solutions and allow us to provide proper irrigation without having things leak around the tooth and we can contain everything with inside that pulp chamber. Once that area is built up and you're comfortable with your field, you're gonna go ahead and follow your normal endodontic sequencing and treatment protocol. My systematic endodontic protocol involves initial canal assessment, orifice opening, working length determination, guide path formation, final shape. After that final shape has been created, we now need to consider an irrigation protocol. For this particular treatment, I use the Genowave Wave protocol. And again, the Genowave Wave protocol is more than just a disinfecting protocol. It's basically an added way to help clean that root canal system just a little bit differently and better than our traditional irrigation techniques and instrumentation techniques. The Genowave protocol involves an additional step of platform building to create some sort of sealing barrier on the tooth and then you apply a handpiece which then goes through series of solutions including distilled water, sodium hypochlorite, and EDTA. Alternatively, you can consider a positive pressure irrigation technique or a negative pressure irrigation technique. Once everything has been properly irrigated and disinfected, then you want to dry your canal system and move forward with your obturation technique of choice. My preferred obturation technique of choice at the time of this recording is a single cone technique with a bioceramic sealer placement. And what I do is I inject the bioceramic sealer into the canal about at the mid root level and bring that material up to about the orifice level. I will then take a small diameter paper point, 04 paper point, either a 20 or 25, measured to length and carry that sealer to the apex. I'll then pre-fit my cones, which are generally 04 tapered cones, uh, until I find one that fits well. I then re-inject the sealer inside that root canal system to about that same mid-root level and then backfill the sealer to the area of the orifice and I insert the pre-fit cone through the sealer. The idea of the single cone with bioceramic sealer is to displace the sealer with inside the canal with the gutta percha cone. We're really relying on the sealer to seal off the root canal system because the gutta percha is just providing the conduit to create the hydraulics for the sealer to flow with inside that root canal system. This is in contrast to other obturation techniques like a uh, warm vertical or something that requires bulk gutta percha to hold a thin micro coat of sealer. The single cone obturation technique relies on uh, bulk sealer as opposed to bulk gutta percha to seal off that root canal system. Once those cones are placed inside that root canal system, I'll sear them off at the level of the cable surface outline. I will not take them down to the orifice quite yet because I always want to make sure I capture some sort of cone fit imaging. And my cone fit imaging is generally done with sealer in place so I can really see the flow of that sealer and that will give me the opportunity to make any adjustments and corrections. As I look at my cone fit image, I get information as far as whether or not I need to improve upon the obturation material itself. I look for voids, uh, areas of radiolucencies within the root canal obturation material itself. And my rule is if there's a void somewhere in the coronal aspect or in the mid-root aspect, I'm going to consider applying a little bit of heat in the vertical dimension to this obturation material to flow the material just a little bit better uh, to address those voids. If the void happens to develop somewhere in the apical third, I'm going to remove my cone and I'm going to try again. Looking at this cone fit image, you can tell I was able to locate an instrument and treat three canal systems. Again, we, when we relate this back to the morphology of what we looked at on that CBCT, we were curious as to whether or not there was going to be some tissue present in between that mesial buccal and that palatal fusion. Uh, we know there is most likely tissue present there, but I was not able to negotiate or open up any canal system in between there. I was happy with the appearance of my cone fit with my sealer in place, so I went ahead and moved forward and completed this process. 
Because I was satisfied with the appearance of my cone fit image, I chose not to add any vertical heat to this particular case, but rather just taking my heat source and searing off that gutta percha at the level of the orifice and using a 5.7 or 911 plugger to compact and condense the gutta percha at the orifice level only. As we look at the clinical view here of the final obturation, we see some gutta percha in some areas in between the mesial buckle and the palatal root. Those are the areas that I was attempting to address some of that isthmus uh, anatomy, some of that fusion anatomy, and my files weren't able to get all that far. So the question is, is how much do we choose to sacrifice inside these root systems to look for something that may or may not be there? We have to make judgment calls. We have to understand the risks versus benefits of trying to trough deep inside these teeth to look for these particular root canal systems. The cone beam never showed a confirmed MB2. And I felt at this point in time it was going to be a little bit too risky and a little bit too aggressive for me to trough all the way down that isthmus area in order to open up a canal that may or may not be there. Following completion of the treatment, I tend to prefer to place a final restoration. However, if my restorative dentist prefers that I do not, at very minimum, I'm going to place an orifice barrier over the canals in order to protect that work uh, once we're done. If my restorative dentist requests that I leave the option for a post, I don't want to block them out. So I'll refrain from having the orifice barrier flow over the palatal canal in this particular situation. The case is then provisionalized for the time being. I'll take a piece of endodontic sponge, apply it into the pulp chamber proper itself, and put a little cavet over the top to close this off. And I will then send the patient back to the restorative dentist for the final restoration. This is the final obturation. You're seeing the distal buccal canal and you're seeing the palatal canal and you're seeing part of the mesial buccal canal. The zygoma is blocking us out as far as seeing the entire mesial buccal system. So that's why it's always important for us to capture a couple of angles here. So you can see that second angle, this is a distal shift. I always encourage at least two post-operative images being taken, a straight on and a shift film either to the mesial or to the distal in order to understand that anatomy a little bit better. On occasion, I'll actually request a post-operative CBCT in order to really see any sort of anatomy that may not be picked up in my traditional two-dimensional projection imaging. Endodontics is fun and exciting and can be very rewarding when the treatment goes as planned. A big part of successful endodontics comes with understanding the anatomy and morphology of these teeth prior to the treatment process and planning for the best outcome that you can. I hope you enjoyed this video today. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and I'll see you in my future videos. I'm Bill Nudera. Thanks for watching.